Hello everyone, I'm Frey. Hi, I'm Minya. And we are here to discuss about Daniel Kolax, the Church of Science. But first, let us get to know him. Maybe he's not familiar to most of us because he is a contemporary philosopher. So he was born on 1955 in Zagreb, Austria, and now he is a professor at the William Patterson University. His works focused on philosophy of mind and language, the philosophy of physics and mathematics, the history of philosophy, and the philosophy of arts. One of his most famous works was a book titled, I Am You, The Metaphysical Foundations for Global Ethics, which tackles about open individualism. But we will not talk about it today. We will focus on the passage of the Church of Science from his book, The Experience of Philosophy. Here, he argues about the famous debate between Ptolemy and Copernicus. Before we go to the discussion proper, I want you to step outside. You know, the semester has been busy and we rarely go outside. So, this is your sign to get some work to stay healthy. Now, do you feel the warmth of the sun? When you observe the sun, can you see where it moves? We all know that the Earth is the one that revolves around the Sun. The history of the solar system takes back to centuries ago. Initially, Aristotle believed that there are only four elements, the Earth, the air, the fire, and the water. The stars were made up of separate deep element, quintessence, and were incorruptible and eternal. Motion in the heavens was natural and force and circular so that the planets and sun orbited a peaks and then moving spherical earth in circular orbits. Aristotle's works had a profound influence on Western thought. A geocentric worldview became ingrained in Christian theology, making it a doctrine of religion as much as natural philosophy. Claudius Ptolemy or Ptolemy was the one who standardized the geocentric theory in his Triatis Almagis. We will discuss the details more later. 16th century was the height of scientific revolution and there has been a drastic change in scientific thought. Polish astronomer Nicholas Copernicus believed that all planets revolve around the sun. He put a disclaimer because of fear of criticism from the church. Then, evidence for a heliocentric system groundedly mounted. When Galileo pointed his telescope into the night sky in 1610, he saw for the first time in human history that moons orbited Jupiter. If Aristotle were right all about, about all things orbiting Earth, then these moons could not exist. Galileo also observed the pieces of Venus, which proved that the planets orbits the sun. He was, he was tried for hearsay under the Roman Inquisition and placed under house arrest for life. Colac starts the passage by posing a scientific fact that we basically know. We do not question this scientific fact because scientists believe it to be true. Now, here's where Colac is concerned with indoctrinated belief of the solar system. It may indeed be true and it may be known to be true by scientists. But why do you believe it? Kolak then contextualizes this question to real life situations we may have experienced. Let us take note that Kolak is an American Croatian. Upon further research, I have found that Croatia has a history of teaching religious materials in schools. In fact, the first schools were opened by churches and it was desirable that each parish schools were, were open. It may have some traces when he was studying and, and observed it. Similarly, the 19th century school houses in the United States were established by various religious organizations which teaches religion to the students. Religious pictures such as scenes from heaven, various saints, 
and the hierarchy of the angels were not uncommon in nearly every school across the country. These religious icons have since been replaced with pictures of scientists like Albert Einstein and various charts such as the hierarchy of the elements. And what elementary school classroom today does not have at least one picture of the solar system with the sun at the center and all the planets going around the sun? Probably it was such image that introduced you to the Copernican based on the heliocentric view of the solar system. Kolak says that the indoctrination of this belief to the students is easy for the teachers. When we look back to our past lessons, the teacher who points to the poster of the heliocentric theory is using ostensive teaching. It only imprints a visualization of the mind of the children, but they are not thought to think critically. In principle, can't we just go outside and see it for ourselves? Kolak said that if we try to doubt what everybody knows to be true, to see it for ourselves, we will be a laughing stock. It is like trying to figure out whether a sculpture is alive or not. We all know that an inanimate object is not alive, but we still want to know the truth for ourselves, so we get a first-hand experience with it. We touch it or observe if it moves. Just like we are certain that the Earth is moving around the Sun, let us doubt the obvious. We don't really doubt the scientific certainty now, but if we did, how could we go to see the truth for ourselves? Science, after all, is based on experience. Kala creates a scenario from which we see the truth for ourselves. We step outside and look up. What do we see? The sun rises, then sets. The moon rises, then sets. The stars move across the heavens. Everything seems to be moving around Earth. So, we go hop in a rocket and leave the Earth. We are now in a synchronous orbit with the Earth. Many satellites are in a synchronous orbit, meaning that they move at the same speed that the Earth revolves, thus remaining in the same position over the Earth. Looking down, we see that the Earth is directly below us and it is perfectly motionless. Or should I rather say, rotating at its axis, but remaining in the same position. When we look up, the sun, the moon, and all the stars seem to be moving around the Earth. That is because we are still in the Earth's reference frame. It is like tossing a coin inside a moving train. The coin did not smash in the box, but rather it goes back down. This is because the coin is still in the reference point of the train. Moving forward, we go to the reference frame of the sun. Again, the sun is below us and the stars, planets, seem to move around it. But if we fly to Mars, it is just the same as the observations before. It seems like Mars is the center. Kola concludes that whatever reference point in the solar system you're looking out from, that place will seem to be still and everything will seem to be moving around you in that place. Is there true motions of the planets and the sun in some absolute sense? Even if they did, you can't see it just by looking. According to church at that time, facts about the true nature of the world, including the solar system and the universe, are not available to us without revelation from God. In that point, Kolak says that the church was right and the empirical method of seeing it for ourselves would not suffice. He then asserts that the problem is that looking does not settle it because there is no position in the universe from which to look. As Einstein showed, there is no absolute vantage point in the universe where we could stand to see the true natures of anything. The only absolute Thing about motion is that it is relative. At this point, Kola questions why do we prefer the Copernican model than the Ptolemaic one? Apparently, the obvious answer is that the Copernican model is, pa is by far the most accurate. One of the evidence he presented was the retrograde motion. 
we will be more scientific in terms of this sign. The planets closest to the sun move faster and the outer planets move slower, but they all go in the same direction. Retrograde motion is an illusion created when we observe other planets from the moving Earth. The planets the usually move Note that a planet toward, still rises in the east and sets time, in the west on any given night due to the rotation of Earth. This video will focus on a variation of that motion known as retrograde motion. Retrograde this apparent motion, motion concerns the... In this image, Mars was photographed every 5 to 7 days between October 2011 to July 2012. Once all the photos were combined by aligning the stars in the background, it appears as though Mars looked back on itself by continuing the orbit. But Ptolemy also accounted for it in the use of epicycles. Each planet, such as Mars, does not just go around the Earth in a circle, but circles its own orbit around the Earth. Each of the planets and the moon and the sun moves about the earth along its own eccentric circle or the deferent, with its epicycles in the deferent. Using several epicycles, Ptolemy was able not just to account for the positions perfectly but also to predict future positions. His system was accepted by the entire western world until the 16th century then how did we ever come to pick the copernican model over ptolemy's the next most obvious answer that presents itself is that the copernican system must be simpler we should take note that copernicus did not refute the assumption of uniform circular motion of ptolemy so he was also able to plot his own epicycles of the planets which are the ellipses Meanwhile, Ptolemy, as an astronomer, mathematician, and geographer, his geocentric theory and global coordinate system were highly influential, and we use a similar system today. Not only does the U.S. Coast Guard still use Ptolemaic calculations because it is simpler, but there is also inconsistency in the number of epicycles in both theories. As Kolak puts it, the best scientific, historical, and philosophical experts cannot even agree as to who had many epicycles. He presented several accounts regarding to this matter, which shows that the Copernican system, though widely accepted, is still inconsistent. So, according to Otto E. Neugebauer in his book, The Exact Sciences in Antiquity, the popular belief that Copernicus' heliocentric system constitutes a significant simplification of the Ptolemaic system is obviously wrong. The Copernican models themselves require about twice as much as the Ptolemaic models and are far less elegant and adaptable. These reinforces your feet in science and history, isn't it? But we're not talking about quantum mechanics or super, super string theory. This debate is as simple and incontrovertible as whether the Earth goes around the Sun. This is a question of brute scientific fact that is, that is supposedly settled centuries ago, yet we still discovered something new that either supports or criticizes it. Hasn't it been so indoctrinated to us that questioning the obvious and the incontrovertible facts as the movement of the earth seems ultimately preposterous and, as Kolak puts it, perhaps a bit like intellectual blasphemy. He also cited some remark of Paul Perubin. Paul Perubin claimed that science is taught at a very early age and in the same way, they taught religious facts. It does not attempt to awaken children's critical abilities, and it continues after the university, where the indoctrination is systematized. As much as people criticize different societal institutions, 
science is exempted from it because it is widely accepted. The process of demythologization or the removal of the mythical components in the Bible and the universal truth is primarily motivated to avoid any clash between Christianity and scientific ideas. If any conflict occurs, then science is right and Christianity is wrong. He remarked that science has now become as oppressive as the ideologies it had once to fight. Kolak challenges us that if we are convinced that God does not exist because science presents new, clear-cut, and incontrovertible facts, then are these facts any better? He believed that during the scientific revolution of the 16th century, it becomes very clear that any view that has ever held by anybody has turned out to be either false or deeply questionable. At the time it was held, people took the view to be the final truth. The scientists claim, though they know that their works are not perfect, that they were almost on the verge. Today, scientists still talk this way like the emerging development in artificial intelligence and more innovation that makes life a lot easier. Based on what happened to past truths, we have a good reason to believe that much of what science now claims to be true will be revealed as false soon after. Science might well be the best way to truth, but if the propositions we believe about the world arrived in our minds via having our psychological attitudes indoctrinated into us by scientific authorities, then we are not convinced of those propositions. Well, we are indoctrinated. We are members of the faith of, as Kolak puts it, what may be the greatest religion that has ever existed yet. It is the Church of Science. There are three points that Kolak is presenting in this passage. First, science is indoctrinated into us because we learn and accept scientific facts with unquestionable certainty. In the same way, religion indoctrinates its beliefs and practices to its followers. So, Kolak uses the term church because the indoctrination is like any religion. Second, philosophy puts into perspective the widely accepted truths claimed by scientists. Philosophy ponders, discusses, reasons, investigates, thinks through the propositions that science holds as true just like in any other discipline. Third, even the most basic facts that people accept as true can still be refuted. So Kolak challenges us to question and retest, then re-question and retest and so on, the theories and propositions that science present to us. That is all for our report and have a nice day, stay safe.